Oh. Oh. Our antenna are up. Getting a dispatch to the satellite. Flashcard. Come on in, John Duggan. Chair and good morning. How are you? I'm 2,000 miles away from the Kildare GA controversy, I can tell you that. I'm <laughs> a long way away from it, so... Um, Plenty of controversy you. where you are, though. Yeah, I was... Um, folks, get two televisions for your house, because you need to watch these things in split screen, which I did last night. Uh, Spain against Morocco and Portugal against Iran. It was great watching them on split screens. And the badness that ensued. Well, let's talk a little bit about Portugal first. Um, people mostly will have seen that game because it was on uh, both BBC and RTE last night here. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure about Ronaldo. It was either nothing or it was a red card. It definitely didn't feel like it was a yellow card offence. I would agree with that. I thought he clapped him, to be honest. I thought he clapped him. I thought it was a red, personally. Fergus McFadden was one of the people on Twitter disagreeing with me. Um, and it was just one of these, Enrique Caceres is the name of the referee, and just, just so much in that game. There's the fact that Charisma scored a great goal. Uh, then we had the penalty, which was a VAR overrule, or, or you know, he, they, 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 he changed his mind. He overruled himself, effectively, after the VAR uh, consultation. Ronaldo missed that. That could have huge consequences, because they've got to go to uh, Sochi now to play Uruguay instead of playing Russia at home uh, in terms of uh, in, in Moscow. Uh, and that could have been an easy quarter-final uh, route for Portugal. Now they've got to go to, uh, to Sochi to play Uruguay. Uh, and then uh, I, thought he, I thought it was a red, lads. I thought it was a red. Uh, it's difficult. You can't say that they bottled it. I mean, the, the, the review happened, uh, and the referee decided that it was yellow. Um, Gary Lineker, one of the people, saying that he didn't feel there was enough deliberate uh, intent in, in Ronaldo's actions, but I thought he, I thought he did it. Uh, and then you had the madness of uh, Iran getting a penalty, which I think has caused the most controversy of the night. The Suarez couldn't get out of the way of the ball. Um, referee decided it wasn't a penalty. Then the, the VAR recommendation uh, to review the incident uh, appeared. He reviewed it uh, and then he gave it and then they scored it. And then uh, Mehdi Taremi nearly won it. Iran could have ended up topping the group. Instead, they go out of the World Cup. Spain qualify in terms of goals scored as, as, as group leaders. So it ends up that we have Spain and Portugal first and second, the way we would have said it before the tournament started, <laughs> without the complete madness uh, of, of, the la of the last few days. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you actually printed that table a month ago, everybody would be like, ah, oh, that's going to be the most boring group of all time. Look, Spain are going to win it, Portugal are second. In the meantime, you've had a Ronaldo hat-trick with a last-minute free kick against a Spain team who 48 hours had a different manager. It has been a fairly remarkable group, all told, right down to the point where, as you say, Iran have a one-on-one -on -one where he just has to dink it over the keeper and history is being made. Yeah, it was just... It was just fa I, I couldn't... I, I did this... You know that Simpsons thing where Homer Simpson's head explodes? <laughs> um, it, it turns into a balloon and it just explodes. I, like, I counted five big incidents from the Iran-Portugal game. The Charisma goal, the Ronaldo miss from the penalty, the Ronaldo red card, the penalty, the Suarez that wasn't, and then the miss. And then with Spain and Morocco, you have the Butaib goal, which was a mess between Ramos and Iniesta. Then you have a brilliant play from Iniesta for Isco to equalize. Then you have uh, Jar Piquet, lucky enough that he touched the ball, nearly going in two-footed, and was lucky that he touched the ball, otherwise he, sh he should have gone. Uh, then you uh, Morocco, brilliant header to, to, to go ahead. And then you have that Aspas uh, equaliser that is uh, originally ruled as, as, as an offside and, and then ruled as a goal. So I think with the VAR, there's a, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uh, people are getting new to this uh, brand new system. I think it's a good thing. I think we would have seen Neymar getting a penalty. He shouldn't have got one yeah. the other day. And of course, with the hand of history would have changed for Irish people. The hand of Henri would not have got through VAR, not have got through VAR. And ultimately, it is only a recommendation. It's only a video replay, and it's up to the referee. The referee's decision is the final. The referee has to instigate the what, what uh, Nordium Amrabat called was bull. Um, uh, our, I don't know if people saw that viral after the Morocco-Spain game. Uh, he just said VAR is bull. Um, but it's up to the referee. Bad referees are bad referees. But I think, I suppose, the thing about it is referees are so used to, that, to, to deciding things in an instant that they're now second-guessing themselves. And I'm wondering, is that causing them a huge amount of confusion internally? That once they're almost, I wonder, just because a VAR says you need to look at this again, are they thinking, well, 
but was my original decision correct? And I think that's probably the conflict within referees' minds at the moment. Yeah, I, th I think I think you're onto something there. It's definitely human error, isn't it, rather than uh, the actual computer's errors. Uh, like, there does some tweaking does need to be made. Like, they were talking on the RTE panel last night that it was a tournament too soon for all of this, but ultimately, this is common sense. You and I could have made the decision, the correct decision on that handball last night. Like, at what point, at what training do you need to give to referees to actually say, listen, this is how you make a pretty blatant uh, off, uh, handball call that isn't? And make it correctly. It, it just doesn't seem that the fine tweaking that's required is really fine tweaking. It's a, a systems failure almost in the brain of a referee. It's 33 cameras they have, the, the four referees, uh, Kalina's team. Uh, but I, I, I do think that generally incidents in football, which is an extremely fast moving game, are few and far between. Massive incidents are few and far between in the, in the history of football. Um, uh, we can count them maybe on two hands. A really, really big instance. And I think that referees, what, what almost needs to be said to them, it's not about the technology, it's about backing themselves. Just because it's gone for a review for two reasons. It, 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 the reasons are a clear and obvious error and a serious missed incident. Just because somebody says, you might need to have a look at that again, doesn't mean the original decision was incorrect. And I think that's where you know, we're having uh, referees that are under pressure, especially with footballers of all people who can ham it up and demand this or demand that in, in really pressurized situations where, as I said, Iran could have gone through, Portugal could, could have gone out, Portugal could have topped the group, and now we have the way it, 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 we, we, we thought it would be at the outset. And, but I do think that just as much as Messi's penalty miss was, was scrutinized, I think Ronaldo's will be hidden uh, amid all the uh, controversy but it could really cost Portugal in terms of the tournament progression. Because you fancy Uruguay now much more after yeah. the quality of their performance. Yeah, they haven't conceded a goal yet, lads. Um, they were on the front foot against Russia, who were um, small. Nikov's dismissal didn't help matters. But by that stage, I think Uruguay were 2 0 up. Suarez with a good free kick. Then we got an own goal. Cherry Chef uh, put the ball into his own net after the great uh, two games he'd had. And then Cavani got off the mark, which is important for him. So um, Russia completely second best, physically, um, you know, out battled. And, um, you know, just poor, I mean, like remember Juba missing an absolute, like slicing the ball to the corner flag at one stage. And I can see Uruguay beating Portugal. I really can. Uh, I think Portugal, I think Morocco were the unlucky team of that group. You know, they were very unlucky against Iran. They should have beaten Portugal and they arguably could have won last night's game as well. So Morocco can hold their heads high out of this World Cup. But I thought Portugal watching last night once again were pretty, pretty ordinary uh, in a frenetic game, in a frenetic game. So... That's the way I, I kind of see it. But look for it from Spain's perspective. They're going to pass Russia out of this World Cup in Moscow on Sunday. They're just going to pass them to death. Portugal, uh, and I think that Portugal and Uruguay is going to be the nastiest, cheatiest game in the history of... <laughs> well, since the first World Cup, I think there was a couple of fairly dodgy games in that one. Um, it's going to be like, was it the, the 54 seconds it took in, in 1986 for the Uruguay players to be sent off against Scotland? <laughs> um, no, I, 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 no it, it, I think it might be more for Portugal side than Uruguay side, to be honest. Um, although there was a lot in the Morocco were really playing on the edge against Spain last night. So there was a lot of nasty challenges from Morocco against Spain. So, yeah, I, I, I'd fancy Uruguay, I have to say, um, having seen Portugal in the flesh and then seeing them last night again. Uh, and now it's tonight, it's all about Argentina, the, the soap opera. Um, I was watching uh, social media, really, really funny, they were analysing in Argentinian television the warm-ups of Messi and Maradona and comparing the warm-ups of the two of them and the body language within the warm-ups. And the warm-up they were showing of Maradona was the, the classic one that everybody ah. knows, the live is life one yeah. from Napoli. <laughs> Which is one the body the best warm-up of all time. And they're comparing that with Messi's normal warm-up for one of the matches against Croatia or Iceland. And that was funny. And you've had minute silences in, in Argentina. And now this talk that Aguero... Um, was part of a uh, internal revolt against the coach Sampaoli, and uh, apparently he's going to be dropped for the match this evening. They're going to change the system again for four four two. If they beat Nigeria and Iceland fail to beat Croatia, Argentina, will, despite all of this madness, will still go through. Uh, and the other group looks pretty straightforward. France and Denmark draw. They both go through with France's group winners, Paul Pogba and Blaise Matuidi, both on yellow cards. And that might mean that Deschamps says we're not going to start the players because yellow cards, you know, they're cumulative. They get wiped after the quarterfinals. 
So if you get two yellows, you'll miss a match. I can't see a way for Argentina to do it tonight. I just think it's too much, it's too late. They've screwed up so much. They're so riven with dysfunction that this is, this is the swan song tonight that we are tuning in to watch the end of Leo Messi's international career and it ends in failure. I would agree with you. I, I think it is too much. I think, I think, I think it's too much of a mountain. Um, if the Croatia game hadn't happened and all the, all the, the crazy changes when he changed from 4 2 3 1 to 4 3 3, he brought players in, he brought three players in. He's now, I think the talk is he's going to bring Di Maria and Benega back into the team. But if they weren't good enough to play against Croatia, why are they good enough now? Um, of course, the door has been opened by the Nigeria win over Iceland, but Nigeria only need a draw. Um, Ahmed Musa scored now four goals in two World Cup games. Um, and uh, they can just sit back. Now, they're more of a team that would probably like to attack more. But I think, yeah, I would agree with you. I think there's just too much dysfunction, uh, even for Messi to... Uh, and, and he hasn't shown any inclination of it, grabbing the ball in the centre circle and owning the ball for 90 minutes. Not the way he plays. Don't think it's going to happen. And uh, look, it's another split-screen moment tonight. Um, it's not going to be about Croatia... And Iceland, I can't really even really see Iceland getting out of that. Anything out of that? They twenty-two percent possession against Argentina, only thirty-nine percent possession against uh, Nigeria. And despite all the changes Croatia are expected to make with the amount of yellow cards they have, including including Rakitic, uh, I can see this all about being the Argentina Nigeria game. But I can't see, I can't see it. I can't see it, lads. I think the other other group is much more straightforward. I think France and Denmark will go through. Yeah, Denmark and France, that's 3 o'clock, both of those games. It's Australia who kind of lag a little bit behind there, three points behind Denmark. They'll need Denmark to lose and they'll need to win themselves to make uh, the goal difference even. And then when you look at uh, the goal scored, then Australia might actually pass them out if, if that's the case. But I guess from the point you're trying to make there about uh, France and the yellow cards, they're going to be a weak inside. It's going to be quite straightforward in that, you'd imagine. And also as well, when you kind of look at the, the overall picture now, when you look at Group C and you look at Group D, the possibility here is a, a France versus Nigeria last 16, but the thing is, if Lionel Messi and Argentina manage to cause a miracle tonight, although it's not quite a miracle, they come up against France in, in the last 16, and I know it's been completely stereotypical here, John, but it is France. France have had a history of, I guess, not being fully coherent when it really matters in a World Cup in recent years, and like, would you be overly surprised if the beast of his Lionel Messi created some sort of miraculous moment where he managed to navigate his way to a quarter final. I'm not saying that they're going to go all the way because it's clearly not going to happen, but I just feel that there is one more incredible story left in this World Cup in the early phases, and Messi and Argentina could be that one. Well, after last night, there could be three or four more incredible stories in the group phases alone. Mm. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I know what you're saying, um, but I just think on the basis of what we've seen, I think France will only improve. I think they'll only improve after their, their opening couple of matches, uh, and, they, and they have a degree of cohesion, a much better degree of cohesion than Argentina do. So um, if Argentina had been unlucky, I mean, I thought they played reasonably well against Iceland, but the amount of panic that set in after that game, after they, did, they failed to win, uh, wouldn't strike me with any kind of confidence about this evening uh, and beyond. And I think even if they do play France, it's not like 1990 when Argentina played Brazil uh, and Maradona, uh, you know, sh shocked the world with this brilliant play for Canigia's goal and Brazil were expected to go through comfortably. And it's not 2010 either when France were in fighting in South Africa and uh, they were melting down uh, under Raymond Dominic. I don't think uh, France are in that position at all. I think France will be in the last four. So, uh, know what you're saying. I think there could be one big push, um, but I think that's, uh, I'm not saying that you're saying this, but I think I think we're hoping for that. But I don't think, I, I don't think, uh, I think it's head and heart stuff. And I think the head will have to say that with the internal strife in, in Argentina and with the fact that Messi is almost checked out and they'll even talk with Aguero and Messi, who are the best pals. If Aguero isn't in the team, how is that going to... Is is Messi, in a way, in agreement with Aguero about uh, the coach? Totally. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, 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 that would... Is there a hidden hand there? Uh, and um, um, once again, I'd be fascinated to see Lionel Messi's body language this evening because you're going to know after 10 or 15 minutes where his head is at, and, 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 and if he's already thinking about um, sunny beaches. John, you're at uh, Denmark-France. Give us your prediction for that one tonight. One, a one-all draw. Um, I think it'll be a draw, but France has to be careful because they don't want to, you know, they, just because they're through, they don't want to be in any way complacent. Uh, Yusuf Poulsen's going to miss the match. Uh, he's, got a, he's got two yellow cards already. Um, William Quist is out for Denmark. 
Uh, but you know, they don't, they don't, Denmark, we know ourselves uh, are better than some of their parts. Uh, I think it'll be a draw, but um, France just have to be avoid complacency. I think that's the big thing because they do want the top of the group. They don't want to end up in, in the last 16 match against Croatia. Good stuff, JD. Thanks a million. All right, lads. Take care. John Duggan with us this morning, uh, live from Russia.